Um, Ms. Durham, I understand that you demonstrated to the court that your employer was accommodating your similarly situated coworkers who had similar light duty lifting restrictions, but not offer, they didn't offer the same accommodations to you while you were pregnant. So what did you think, how did you feel when you learned that even though you proved that others got accommodations, it wasn't enough for you to win your case? Honestly, it, it felt very discouraging. It felt like it was a misunderstanding, which is why I contacted the lawyer in Birmingham about it. The original intent and what we had done was to send them a letter to hopefully clear this up because it really did just seem like it was a big misunderstanding. They were already accommodating others who had restrictions. Ms. Bask, is um, Ms. Durham's experience common? And if so, how would the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act address the issues she faced in court? Yeah, unfortunately, it's, it's all too common. In our recent report, Long Overdue, as you mentioned earlier, um, we found that in over um, you know, two-thirds of cases, pregnant workers are losing their accommodation cases post-young. And in over 70% of those cases, they're losing their cases because they're unable to identify a sufficiently valid comparator or a comparator at all. And, um, you know, that is um, a real barrier to equality um, and justice for pregnant women. Uh, there's another worker, by her name is Cassandra Ducci, one of her cases that really stand out. Cassandra um, worked part-time loading and unloading boxes in Tennessee. She um, requested light duty also per her doctor's orders and a company refused to also accommodate her and pushed her out on unpaid leave. She presented the court a spreadsheet of 261 other employees that were um, provided light duty and also pointed to a coworker that was provided light duty. The court rejected this evidence since the spreadsheet did not have um, detailed info uh, information about others' employees' ability or inability to work um, and so therefore they were insufficient comparators. This is truly an insurmountable and extraordinarily difficult um, uh, burden for a pregnant worker to meet. Yeah, thank you, and, and Ms. Baxter, I wanna follow up um, on some testimony from Ms. McLaughlin. Uh, Ms. McLaughlin, in her testimony, was expressing concern about the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act uh, use of the term known limitation, and Ms. McLaughlin stated that the phrase no, known limitation is clearly different than the definition of a covered disability under the ADA. So I, I wonder if you could take a minute and respond to that concern and what pregnancy-related impairments or disabilities have the courts deemed not covered under the ADA or the ADA Amendment Act, and how would the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act address this? Sure, so um, to take the first question, I would say yes. I mean, the intent of pr the Pregnant Worker Fairness Act is precisely to ensure coverage for pregnant workers with limitations um, or medical needs stemming from pregnancy that don't qualify as covered disabilities under the ADA. Those limita limitations that could jeopardize a pregnant worker's health, um, but that aren't deemed disabilities yet. That's why it's not you know, a covered dif um, disability under the ADA. But please note that the, the um, PWFA borrows very familiar standards from the ADA, like reasonable accommodations, un undue hardship, and the interactive process. So the fundamental nature of, the, um, of the, the law, the fundamental framework is similar, but covered disabilities, no, it's not um, in the PWFA context precisely because um, those are the women that um, pregnant workers are, are often not found to have qualified disabilities. And to answer the question, your next question, the question about the ADA and who was not covered, um, you know, we, we have seen um, that courts interpret the ADA um, in a, even though it was amended in 2008, and I will say that, you know, there are a pool of um, workers, let's say a worker with gestational diabetes, and there have been courts that have ruled, you know, that there are um, workers with pregnancy-related complications that should be covered under the ADA and that are, but there are a lot that we have reviewed that are not, and it's actually, you know, quite alarming. For example, um, you know, Tanya Oliver from Pennsylvania had high-risk medical complications associated with high-risk pregnancy with triplets and needing surgery at the time of birth, and the court said, no, the AD AAA doesn't protect her because high-risk pregnancy is not enough. Or Sylvia Wananusi, who went to the ER while pregnant, was diagnosed with hypermesis of pregnancy, a form of morning sickness, and hypokalemia, low level of potassium. The court also said, not a disability. Jennifer Alger, she experienced severe complications and bleeding at work, but in 2016, the court said she failed to show that her pregnancy-related complications constituted a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. That is unacceptable. Those women need 
clear right to accommodation so they can follow their doctor's orders and stay healthy and on the job. Uh, thank you. I see my time is just about to expire. I just wanted to thank Ms. Wilbur for bringing the business perspective. I spoke with our state labor commissioner, and that was part of the conversation when Oregon passed its bill, too, that the business community really wanted that certainty. So I don't have time for a question, but I, I wanted to thank you for bringing that perspective. And I, I um, now yield five minutes to Mr. Thompson.